Is Ed still here? All right. We will we will now, uh, now hear Bruce's lecture, and then we'll have a short Q and A. Uh, Bruce Backenheimer, a clinical <laughs> professor of management and at uh, Pace University, uh, teaches a number of entrepreneurship uh, courses. Director of entrepreneurship at Pace University, teaches both the uh, under, undergraduate and graduate uh, courses, uh, management and strategy. Uh, Bruce is a member of the board and past chap chapter chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum of New York City and served on the global board of the MIT Enterprise Forum. He has launched successful ventures in the United States and internationally. Bruce has been quoted in a wide variety of publications and interviewed on both radio and television. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So thank you. Thank you, Ella. And thank you um, for having me. And I really have to thank... Um, Ayla for helping us. We're on a, um, a trip uh, here in Israel to, with the title Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship in Israel. It's a small group, only 10 students, half of whom are here, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Kessler, who's, um, who's uh, doing the trip um, with us. I'd like to um, thank Ella. She's been a, uh, an incredible, incredible resource in um, lining up ventures that I'm um, consider myself fortunate to uh, know her, and it's an honor to meet Dr. Ed Malofsky this evening. So I'm going to um, just very quickly go through the, um, the topic, what they don't teach in business school, and I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about myself and our business school and kind of what we do teach at business school and what we don't teach and why. So I have a, um, a kind of crazy career. It's not at all um, academic um, initially. I I got to school in Japan and started working for the Bank of Tokyo. I first week trading billions of dollars. I had never done that before. Then started a arbitrage for an Australian bank, um, which I had never done before. Um, Wall Street was good. My bank account hit the, well, what they call the screw you love. I, I took off and went sailing for a few years. I never went sailing before. Taught myself sailing, lived on um, a boat for about seven years. Um, on one of the islands in the Caribbean, I discovered teak lumber that you could buy for about 30 cents a board foot, and it sells in the U.S. for about $15 a board foot. I never did any woodworking, taught myself that, and opened Annapolis Maritime Corp. Um, then, I, because I spoke some Japanese, I got recruited by a, a company. It was a contractor for the FBI to do forensic firearms identification, like a fingerprint system for guns. I had never done that before. I worked um, in about 25 different countries, including I was here in Israel with the Meshterit in Jerusalem, but also in Cairo and Kuwait and Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Saudi Arabia and um, a ton of other countries. Then I, um, that contract was coming to an end. I wound up getting a um, scholarship from McKinsey and Company and did an MBA in um, HSM in Australia and started an online financial services company just before the dot-com boom. So that was, you know, I started a traditional company and this was an online company. Our first month we had about 50 grand in online advertising and um, within a year we were offered over a million dollars for the company. I should have sold because there's nothing there now. <laughs> I had um, come back to New York. I had kind of burnt my bridge with McKinsey um, with a company, came back to New York and started working in um, venture capital, IQ Venture Partners. Interesting company, the founder or the chairman was um, uh, Phil Smith, who started Citicorp Ventures back in 1967, the original <laughs> president. He invested in companies like FedEx and Genentech and tons of others. So it was interesting work, but that was in like 2001, you know, the dot-com bubble in 2000, 9-11 in 2001 the recession 2002, there wasn't many deals. I'd always wanted to teach. I started teaching at Mercy College um, in Dobbs Ferry where I lived. You may know a student who, um, yeah, his father was my dentist and he took a computer class at, um, at uh, Mercy College. So his dental practice was in his house. So I saw Mark growing up and his father, like a proud Jewish man, my son is a computer genius, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess he was. <laughs> And then I um, started teaching at Pace, originally as an adjunct, and then, um, and then full time. And one of the main side things is with the MIT Enterprise Forum. I 
was on the, I'm on the board in New York. I was a chairman for a few years and on the global board. And we have um, liaison chapters. Mine was Japan and, and Israel, so it was great to work with Ella. And we have these global chapter leadership meetings where, where we met. And as I said, the international work where I probably got most of my experience is um, you know, about um, 25 countries lived in, uh, you travel to about 50. And currently, you know, doing a lot of different things at Pace. Main position as a uh, clinical professor in management and the director of our entrepreneurship program. Run a business plan competition, a pitch contest, um, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. You know, I do some work for like New York City and as I said, do entrepreneurship's a hot topic these days, so I've, I've done a lot of um, press and, you know, print and radio and uh, TV and newspaper. It's been a lot of fun. So that's a little bit about me. And I thought, you know, what they don't teach you in business school, so where do we learn entrepreneurship? Does anybody know who um, Theodore Geisel is, what he wrote? And I'm going to... Congratulations, someone in the room always knows. <laughs> so, congratulations, today is your day, you're off to great places, you're off and away, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, and you could steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know, and you are the guy who will decide where to go. I have an eight-year-old daughter, a couple years ago she asked me to read the story. I looked at this and I'm like, this is what entrepreneurship is about in, in America, at least, or from people that read it. You know, that's what it's about. You have brains in your head and feet in your shoes. You're bright and you have some motivation and it's up to you to decide what to do. So that you don't need from um, an MBA. But one thing I try to get across in the, the MBA program, um, you know, in entrepreneurship is can you suspend your beliefs of what isn't and think differently? And things change. Stuff happens. Um, and things aren't as they seem. So one example I like to use, especially having gone to school in the dot-com bubble, is other bubbles. So I'm going to go through these slides very quickly. But here's companies, brands. This is all exactly the same industry, the same, uh, the same um, names of, of uh, companies with different models. Can see if you can guess what industry it is. Refrigerators. Those are the A's. Here's the B's. More B's. C's. What um, what industries? These are all brand names, company names. Electronics. Electronics. More. Everything. No, they were all exactly the same product. I didn't see DuPont and Apple. Oh, DuPont, yeah, yep, yep, and Apple, yes. But it's not computers and it's not paint. They're all the same thing. The main point is, is that, that things change. These are all L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Here, I'll give you another hint. These are what they put on the front of them. No idea? What are they? They're cars. So. A hundred years ago, today, there was a thousand automobiles in uh, brands, manufacturers in the United States. And, and it changes, you know, the same way the, you know, the dot-com bubble and everything else changes. So I just think it's a, a good way to start to realize, you know, things are, are very dynamic and may not be what they seem. So what do we try to teach? Um, I think there's nothing more synonymous with entrepreneurship than opportunity. And our the university's motto happens to be opportunitas or opportunity, and I really think entrepreneurship comes down to the ability to recognize an opportunity, analyze an opportunity, and capture an opportunity, or to monetize it. What can you teach? You know, recognizing an opportunity is kind of hard. We have a few exercises of you know, different things you could look at to try to recognize an opportunity. It's not that easy to do. Again, you have to kind of suspend your belief of what is. One example I give is a, a pharmacy, a pill bottle. You know, they were developed after World War II and never changed. Why are they small, round, I don't know what they're like here, amber cylindrical thing that's impossible to read? We, we all just think that's what it should be. But analyzing an opportunity, we could certainly teach how to, you know, do financial analysis, market analysis, competitive analysis, then how to capture the opportunity. You know, that idea about ideas are a dime a dozen 
how do you actually go out and, and, and do the business? Um, you know, and this idea of opportunity through entrepreneurship. So very briefly, won't be a commercial for Pace, but just so you know, because I'm assuming not that many people heard of Pace, um, although in um, the early 80s, I went there as a, an undergraduate for a little while after Japan. It was the largest business school in the world. The MBA class alone was 5,000 students. But it started in 1906. Two entrepreneurial brothers from Cincinnati came out, recognized the need for education, borrowed 600 bucks to rent a classroom. When they couldn't find books, they wrote their own. And it started out with men and women. The first class was um, you know, uh, 13 men and women. The entrepreneurship program itself started in 1979 which is, there was only about two dozen um, colleges in the world that even had a course in entrepreneurship at the time. And you probably heard of Drucker, Peter Drucker in his book, Innovation Entrepreneurship. He cited two universities as particularly entrepreneurial, and, and Pace was one. So what do we do in entrepreneurship? Probably a lot of the same things you do here, but you know, field trips, student activities. This is a, a SIFE program up at Columbia. Um, competitions, this is students in free enterprise, I don't know if you have that here, it's the largest student club in the world, getting them in, engaged in things, entrepreneurship conferences, um, this was a, a, the pitch contest, you could see for a three minute talk, we gave out over $50,000, it was um, a lot of fun, business plan competitions, Ayla came in and spoke at one of them, um, lunches, we have conferences held at pace, we um, go outside, you know, to them and you know one of the things if we could talk about what they don't teach in business school maybe an earlier or a, a primary question is can entrepreneurship even be taught um, I like to say it could be taught I'm not sure I could teach it how well people are learning it but um you know it, it's it's a question you know, are entrepreneurs born or made um, and Ed had given some figures earlier on on, on schools the first entrepreneurship course was at um, Harvard in 1947, not, not all that long ago. Even as of 1970, there was only 16 entrepreneurship courses, single courses, you know, in the U.S. The 80s, it began to come into its own. And um, you could see in 2006, the latest numbers that, that I had in this slide, 5,000 entrepreneurship courses just in the U.S. So from when PACES started in 1979, with about two dozen colleges to 5,000 courses in 2006. There's quite a lot. One thing that occurred to me, the idea of teaching entrepreneurship, um, the whole idea of teaching business, and Ed, Ed gave some figures, was, was quite foreign to a lot of people. I remember when I was going to start teaching, I needed a, um, you know, some letters of recommendation. I asked someone I work with who did a postdoc at MIT, and he says, what are you, recommendation for what are you going to teach? I said, business. So you go to college for that? You know, so the idea of, of studying entrepreneurship in college seems foreign to, not, maybe not now, but a short time ago to a lot of people. And I thought what was interesting is that in the, the first issue of the Harvard Business Review back in 1923, when the business school started, People didn't go to college for business. You went, you know, for the liberal arts. The only two professions were law and medicine. And there was just this interesting article on the profession of business. I think entrepreneurship education, you know, maybe a decade ago is where business education was close to a, a century ago. And you could look at other schools. I'm not going to go through these, but, you know, MIT was offered $118 million by um, the British government to help teach them entrepreneurship. Um, MIT said, yes, we'll take it. <laughs> they said, we've we got to figure out what we do to create entrepreneurs. <laughs> if all the entrepreneurial ventures out of MIT, all the sales were um, like considered GDP of a country, it would be the um, 18th largest country in the world. So. They went to figure it out, and they said, well, programs are very hands-on. You know, we, we heard about that experiential. Failure is part of the experience. You know, you went, MIT kids are pretty bright. You went from being the brightest kid, you know, in a small school to struggling in a, in a big competitive program, demanding curricular. And that, that idea about practice thinking, you know, what will work and, and doing things. And Columbia Business School, our neighbors to the north, Glenn Hubbard, who, um, was, is now the dean of the business school, 
said the essence of, he copied me, the essence of entrepreneurship is identifying value and capturing opportunity, you'll recognize, analyze, and capture, should be the core of the MBA program. And he's, you know, a pretty bright um, cookie. So that idea that this is not some thing on its own, but, you know, even, you know, Columbia Business School wants to integrate it into not just the elective courses, but the core, you know, or the Academy of Management, which is the most prestigious journal in, um, in the field of management, which I could say is housed at Pace University, at least up for the next year, is, um, you know, look specifically about, you know, entrepreneurship education and what should we do? Guest speakers. First thing, like, like we have here, uh, case studies, role playing, you know, just a bunch of things. So what I meant to say is it's, it's a new area and it's, you know, being studied from, you know, even places like the Academy of Management. So I, a quote that I love about teaching and learning is from Confucius, who better to start with than Confucius? And he says, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. So obviously that idea about experiential learning, what can you do, because if you do something, you would learn. And then for students to realize, you know, it is important to make mistakes and it is important to really strive for excellence, to do good work. And I like this line uh, used in the pitch contest, you know, from King Lear, Mend your speech a little, lest it may mar your fortunes. You know, review that pitch one or two more times because it may be the difference between getting that, you know, big investment and not. You know, and as a teacher, you know, in giving advice, seek to help not please your friends. And maybe as far as teaching goes, it doesn't work anyway, and those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> See someone shaking your head. So as far as... Um, so that was kind of the introduction, me, Pace, what we try to do. So for the heart of the topic, what, um, what we don't do, you know, what do we, we obviously want to do the right thing, but, you know, what are some of the things that um, we don't do for whatever reason? I think we don't do a, a good enough job of letting people know. You hear about, a lot about passion and persistence. Um, and you know, heard that from the, the speakers, how important that is. But, you know, not to confuse that with arrogance and stubbornness. And sometimes it's hard to be very critical, you know, and, and shake them up and really get um, people thinking differently to be very critical. Someone pointed out that, you know, when you go for your MBA at, in Seattle, whatever, they say, oh, you know, you're all so bright to be here. It was so hard to get in. You're the best and brightest. Whereas in a lot of places, if you go for another degree, you know, you're doing a PhD in the sciences, you start with, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing, you're going to do whatever. And, and sometimes it's hard in the MBA program to, to tell people, listen, you're just being arrogant and, and stubborn. That's, don't mix that up with passion and persistence. Then sales. This, this was um, great. Offer asked how many people, at the very beginning, Ayla asked how many people are entrepreneurs. And tons of hands went up. And then offer asked how many people are salesmen, and no hands went up. Sales is the lifeblood of the company. Sales are the most important thing there is, period. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of, of the biggest Fortune 500 company or a little eight-year-old operating a lemonade stand. It's sales. But why don't we teach it in school? Why don't we teach sales and sales management in business school? Because it's not sexy. What do people want to study? Strategy. Strategy. I want to work for McKinsey. What else? Finance, right? The, the head of the National Venture Capital Association came and spoke at an uh, academic conference that was, was held at Pace, and he says, you know, honestly, and it wasn't just Pace students, Columbia, NYU, Baruch, et cetera, said, I have no idea why all you guys are studying venture capital. None of you will get venture capital. None of you will work for a venture capitalist. Statistically, less than four tenths of one percent of all investment you know, in new um, businesses comes from institutional venture capital. And you want to work for a venture capitalist. You know, you need a golden resume, you know, golden Rolodex, tons of connections, and a golden bank account. You know, it's it's very, very few people that infinitesimally small that get a job at a at a VC fund. But we study, you know, what what sounds sexy, what people want. Um, so we should be teaching sales and, um, you know, and, and salesmanship. But with strategy, which a lot of people 
want to study, you know, it's easy looking at this and, and, and what you should do. But really, and it, it sounds trite, but it's, it's actually very, very deep. The, the essence of strategy is deciding what not to do. You want know the most successful company in America is in terms of return on equity in American business history? It's not an electronics company. It's actually someone in the most, one of the most competitive industries there are, the airline industry. It's Southwest. Good to great. Um, it's what Southwest did that's brilliant is they weren't building an empire, you know, and trying to be all things for all people. They decided what not to do. They don't take luggage. They don't have interline bags. They don't offer food. They don't have first class. They don't have assigned seating. They don't have printed boarding passes. Why? Because their whole strategy is to turn the plane around quickly. But listen, if you're the CEO of this company, you want to offer first class. Why? So when you fly, you can sit in first class. You want to fly to Paris. Why? So you go to Paris. You want all different jets. They have one type of plane, right? The 737. Everything they did is to get the plane to turn around quickly. The essence of strategy is deciding what not to do. And we don't often teach it. We talk about you know, these grand schemes that you think you, you, you should be thinking of to do. The other thing that you know, is incredibly important is you know, social capital. I mean, I think a, a very important part of you know, the MIT Enterprise Forum is social capital. That I develop social capital with you know, Ayla to, to help me in that project, and I, she could ask me, but what exactly is social capital and how do you develop it? Do we teach that in school or do kids think it's how many, you know, LinkedIn connections they have or how many Facebook friends or Twitter followers or I know someone who knows someone. It's, it's more than, than that. Um, you know, we do all these projections and they become spurious. You know, you carry things to five decimal places and, you know, you're sure it's conservative. It's not. It's wrong, period. Every single projection every MBA did in all of history was wrong. It's just a matter of degree and direction. Um, problems. You know, even on the Academy of Management, they talked about case studies. And we use case studies. How often in business world do problems come neatly packaged in a 15 to 20 page document with all the appendices and charts and illustrations? Columbia Business School gave up on case studies. It's out. Because problems don't come neatly packaged like a case study. So why are we teaching case studies? Not sure, because the same reason the pill bottle looks exactly the same since 1947. With the only exception in 1978, they added a child-proof cap. Why is it a little round bottle that you can't read the directions? Can I uh, interact? Please. I think case studies are very good because um, it helps isolate some concept or some particular approach. Uh, to give an example, one of the uh, case studies that uh, we did in business school was about identifying what business a company is really in and really expanded one's right. mind to think that in some ways Intel isn't just a chip manufacturer. They right. also are involved in many other businesses as well. Uh, that's just one of many case studies no. I remember. And the concept then stays with you and you can use it in, uh, it, it, it does, and I, um, I, I've written case studies, I've had case studies written about me, and my students are in the back row, and we use tons of case studies. My only point, given the topic, you know, what don't they teach in business school, they don't teach how to really go out and, and figure out what the problem and all the information you need if you're going to package it so nice and neatly. So what Columbia did is they went to like case notes where they provide something and you have to go out. But yes, case studies... Uh, again, I use them, I, I've written them, and I've, I've had them written about my companies. So they, they are a very useful tool. The problem is, is what don't we do? We become too dependent on them. Again, we just do things that have always been done in, and repeat them. And is it an effective tool? Yes. But how many times have, you know, you said someone recently, I heard, you know, the best project you could do for an MBA is tell everyone right now, go sell something for 10 bucks. See how hard it is to get someone to open their wallet and take out a $10 bill. You know, so we just become dependent on because it it's, it's been done, it's easy, it's, I'm familiar, they're familiar. You know, there's not going to be a letter to the president or to the dean, like, what did he have me go out and I got slapped for trying to sell something for $10 or whatever. The point is, is that if we're really trying to teach something new, like entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurship, 
Um, that's not something they teach in business school. Or the other thing we do is, is we compartmentalize everything. Management department, uh, Professor Kessler and I are in the management department. We offer entrepreneurial finance. We're not allowed to teach it. Only the finance department could teach it. And if they haven't taught it in nine years and they don't want to, they don't get it. Entrepreneur marketing has to go there. But how many problems, you know, for business people, is it, is it just a management problem or just a marketing problem? It's a business problem. Are we going to get students to think integratively and recognize problems? If, if you're only allowed to teach finance, if you use the word management in a course title, I'm going to the dean. If you call it financial management and not management, these things actually happen. So it's... And then they stand outside the classroom doors to make sure that you're not teaching the wrong thing. Because <laughs> it's our department. It's, you know, we don't practice what we preach. It's all stovepipe organization. We fight for every penny of resources. And we're not teaching integrative problem solving. So that's what business schools don't teach, back to the title. Um, implementation is really hard. And achieving scale is like near impossible. You know, it's easy to sit on the back of the classroom and doing the case and say, oh, what they should do, Kodak? Oh, they drop out of, you know, film, go digital. What does it really take to do that? When you have people that have been at the company 40, 50 years, they're all going to give up on digital, on, on film that they, that they know and they, you know, they know everything about. They have all their customers. They can make a big margin and drop it and learn how to sell a digital camera, you know, a new product to a new customer with, like, no margin. You know, it ain't, it ain't happening. So, you know, what, you, it, it's easy, again, to sit back and Kodak should do this, someone should do that, here, this and that, but they don't realize, you know, how hard it is to make that happen. And if you make a wrong mistake, you know, hundreds of people may lose their job. It was a great exercise. When I went to business school, they did a, it was kind of a case study and asked, you know, okay, what's the result? And, um, one of the students, first day of school, and as offer said, you know, write to Coke, oh, and what should they do? And you know, a few people raised their hand, and um, somebody said, you know, you got to fire 10% of the workforce. He said, you're an idiot. Get out of my class. You, you have no business being here. He's like, what do you mean it, Bob? <laughs> anyway, they go through this whole thing. Finally, the guy leaves the room, you know, with his tail between his legs after putting up a fight. He goes, he sends another student, go get him. Come in, how does it feel to be fired? You know, <laughs> it was a great exercise the first day of class. But really, you're an idiot. How did you get into this school? Get out of my classroom. <laughs> Don't teach that too much. Um, and achieving scale, you know, we see these companies that have made it. And it's, it's hard. How do you grow that fast? You know, like as V, as v did, it's, it's, it's really, really tough. Especially because you know, entrepreneurs you aren't always that good at delegating. You know, they want to do it themselves, and you, you can't scale if you, you know, can't delegate. Um, which is the next point. Talented people are really, really, really hard to find. And when you just have a little startup, you know, it's really hard to attract them. So you know, they say, oh, I'm going to get a program, I'm going to get a this, I'm going to get a that. You know, bright people, which is the, you know, I think the, the core of success is people you know, they're hard to find. And if you could find them, they're really hard to recruit. And if you could recruit them, they're really hard to retain. And people, you know, are hard to deal with. It, it takes a lot to, to deal with, with people. And the majority of the people are like apathetic adults that really don't care. You know, they, they are. I remember there was a big protest outside of... Um, Pace University one day, the Sal president's salary was really high and enrollment was falling. We're having financial problems. Students were outside protesting his salary. And I came up and someone put a, um, a TV camera in my face and a microphone and said, are, are you a student here? Can you come? And I said, no, I'm not a student. I, I work here. And they said, how many people work at Pace? And I said, there's about six of us. <laughs> and one of them. In fact, a lot of people just don't care. You know, they're just... They're not motivated and, and, you know, driven and passionate. And it's hard, you know, to, to get them and keep them motivated and driven and passionate. Um, and life's not fair. We, we don't teach that. We, we teach more of a, a Horatio Alger story. You know, work hard if you're, you know, passionate and you, and you work hard and you, 
you know, do the right things, you know, you'll, you'll succeed. And it's nice to hear stories about, you know, Zuckerberg and all those others, but, you know, that Horatio Alger, you know, type of thinking, but how many people were smart, really smart, went to the top schools, worked really hard, 20 hours a day, did everything by the book that they were supposed to and failed miserably. We, we don't hear about them too often. But believe me, they're, they're a lot more than the, than the people that made it. Um, so life's not fair. You could do everything right and you could work really hard and, and fail. And I think one of the, the other really big things that, that business schools don't do well, aside from not teaching sales, is we, we teach this, this stuff that businesses are, and people are basically rational. It's nonsense. You know, people make decisions for power and greed and position and politics and money. You know, you know, the edifice complex, you know, they build a big edifice. You know, if, you know, the CEO, you know, the CEO of another bank, then I want to be bigger and acquire banks and all. A lot of decisions are not made <laughs> rationally, and a lot of people don't, you know, do things rationally. I can give you tons of examples of behavioral economics and, and the way, you know, people, um, you know, think differently or, you know, that, that, that's not at all rational, either or for yourself or for a business. I mean, you could read, you know, Sidney Finkelstein, While Smart Executives Fail. Um, there's a, a great book Dan Kahneman just released on, you know, people think that it's, it's not rational. Even when you try to think, it's not rational. And we teach, you know, how these businesses are going to, you know, analyze dividend policy and this and that and think strategically. I mean, some of them do a good job. And boy, I, you know, I have slides up, you know, I don't want to say what, what company, but, you know, that they're the best in, like, human resources, and um, my wife works there, and it's, a, it's crazy. I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely insane. They have to hot bunk their desks, and, and their HR is, is insane. It's not rational. It's that the guys in HR have some power and, and want to exert it and, and make people do the, the craziest things. I don't want to get onto too much because I'm being web broadcast. But businesses are not as rational as, as we um, like to think it as I think we, we teach in school. Um, effort doesn't count, only results. You know, in business, it's the bottom line. What's the bottom line? You know, an income statement, right? Revenue minus expenses, net profit. You know, during the, the dot-com days, if, if your stock was going up, you didn't care that some idiot was spending $3 million for a, a 30 second internet ad, right? If, as long as things were going up. Because why? The bottom line was positive. But you cared about the results. You know, in school, you know, they do a lot of work and want a good grade, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not about how much effort you put in. You know, sometimes people that, you know, weren't that bright or didn't do the right thing may do well, and those that worked really hard did poorly. I worked on my first career on Wall Street, and um, you know, as a trader, you know, trading literally billions of dollars on a trade. And sometimes, I swear, I felt like you know I should go. What did I go to college for this for? It was just a, a guess. It was luck. I mean, I might as well go downstairs and do like the the three card Monty. You know, what what am I doing? You know, it's it, it's it's tough. You get whipped side by the market, and you're like. You feel like an idiot. You do well. You feel like a master of the universe. But, you know, it's, um, it's difficult. And, and valuation, you know, we teach, you know, in, in finance. Again, this spurious accuracy that, you know, if you do a discounted cash flow or an IRR or an MPV and you carry it out to a few decimal places, you know, that's it. Or a manager will do a project because it has a positive NPV. If the manager wants to relocate to Paris and they're talking about opening an office there, he'll get the NPV to be positive by changing the assumptions. Um, you know, the, the whole basis of finance, even things like compound interest, it sounds very exact, doesn't it? What's the whole premise of compound interest? That you reinvest the, you know, the interest at the coupon rate. When does that ever happen? So it's, it's just spurious accuracy. And in the end, you know, Wall Street, what, why are stocks going up and down 10, 20, 30 percent a day sometimes? It's not because the net present value of all future cash flow is discounted to today <laughs> divided by the number of shares outstanding equals the stock price that goes on your iPhone. It's fear and greed. Those are the only two things that drive the market. 
I remember my first job at this, I, my first day at IQ Venture Partners, this company was coming in. I got the financial statements. I'm doing everything. The guy comes in to present. He says he's putting up half the money, you know, $2 million himself. Yeah, Fred said, oh, um, Phil says, yeah, we'll invest. I'm like, what? Don't we have to do all this? No, if he's putting up half the money he believes in it, we could believe in it. <laughs> like, anyway, so I think we teach a little bit too much emphasis on finance to the, to the point that if, you know, you divide things, they get enough decimal places, it must be accurate. Also, this idea of uh, bigger is better. I was just recently used a, a new intro to management um, textbook, and at the beginning there was this term grand strategy that I never heard of. I mean, I read hundreds of you know, books on strategy and, and dozens of textbooks. I'm like, what is this grand strategy? I never heard this term. And they said the three grand strategies was growth, stability, and retrenchment. And then I realized why I never heard that term. Anyone want to guess? Because all other strategies, all other strategy textbooks assumed that your strategy was for growth and only for growth. They never talked about a strategy for stability. Who ever heard of a strategy for stability? Well, you know, in, in a bad economic time, a recession, maybe you need a strategy for stability. So I think this idea that we teach, you know, growth a strategy for growth and that growth is good and basically growth is always good or bigger is better. You know, in negotiations, one of my favorite MBA classes, you know, screwing people isn't a successful business model. You know, if it's not fair, it's, it's not going to be a, a, a lasting, um, you know, good deal. It's not going to be a good relationship in the long term. Fairness counts. And empathy batters the ability to Empathize, whether it's a subordinate or a business partner, you know, do you have that emotional intelligence? You know, can you not just you know, screw someone, but can you understand them and figure out something that's you know, like a win-win proposition? Um, this, and there's just a few more, and I'll finish up. The, um, nobody learns more than the person at the head of the class. Really, I, I don't think anyone learns more than me. I was teaching at this, this other college, and they asked me, the professor teaching a logic class left like an hour before the class, you know, quit, went back to New Zealand, and they said, would you teach a logic class in philosophy? I've never taken a class in logic or philosophy in my life, but nobody learns more than the person at the head of the class. I figured I could keep ahead, but you really do learn a lot, and what I try to, um, you know, tell students, I realized I finished my MBA and started teaching, because I did my MBA very late, and I started teaching soon afterwards, Suddenly this light went off that when I studied as a student, I was trying to like memorize things and guess what the teacher was going to ask. But when I started teaching, it was like, let me see if I read this material for how to teach it. Suddenly like, oh, I understand. <laughs> you know, I wish I would have thought of it that way from the beginning. And then the last couple, um, an IPO or a trade sale is not the only exit strategies. Sometimes you just have to know when to fold them, when to hold them and when to fold them. This company that I did in Australia, Stock Central, I saw the dot-com bubble burst. We were going from 50 grand a month in you know, online advertising sales to five bucks. But my partner, who was emotionally tied into this, because it was really, he's the one who started. I was just helping him build it into a business, you know, couldn't see that you know, the music was over and he's still dancing. So sometimes you just have to know when to fold, and I don't think we teach enough like when to quit. We just teach that, you know, that Horatio Alger, just keep working, be, you know, persevere, and, and everything will be better. And um, life matters. It's easy to start in, easier to start a new business than perhaps a new family. You know, if you lose your, you know, happiness is important. And the um, last thing, stay hungry and stay foolish. Where's that from? Jobs. Right. So. Um, the, earth the Earth, right, the whole Earth catalog. So that's a, a speech that um, his Stanford commencement speech I showed every year. I mean, obviously, a lot of people have heard it now, um, you know, as, as he passed. But, you know, if you listen to that advice, your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. You know, we have a big accounting program. A lot of people go to Pace to get accounting because they could get a job. But boy, if you, it's great if you love accounting. But if you don't, it's a miserable 
life, and I think often we don't talk about finding what you love and, and doing, no, whatever job it is, if, if you don't love it. I mean, people love being a lawyer, people hate being a lawyer. But you've got to think about, how do you figure out what you love, because that's what you're going to do great. You could love, you know, whatever, accounting or, or finance, or you, you could hate it. I'm not putting any judgment on any field. I'm just saying, you know, it's so important to, um, to find that. And that, that message, you know, that resonated with me, and I think a lot of other people in that commencement speech, you know, the 2005 commencement speech, and, you know, what is risk matter in the face of death is important, and I don't know that we, um, we talk about that enough, you know. What are you really passionate about, and, and how do you find that passion? So, um, so thanks, that's it. <laughs>